Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Eastern Consolidated, MNT Bank, Sterling National Bank, Meridian Capital Group, the Wickoff Organization, Aerial Property Advisors, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, Perfect Building Maintenance, Genova Burns. Additional funding has been provided by AKA Hotels, Corming Communities, Amtrust, Title Insurance Company, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Laumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Cohen Equities, Collier's International NYC, Collins Building Services, Connect One Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Dime Community Bank, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handrow Properties, Handler Real Estate Organization, Hodges Ward Elliott Inc., I Funding, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Commerce Bank, New Banks, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, People's United Bank, Polsonelli, Rosewood Realty Services, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Knackle Group at Cushman and Wakefield, The Moynian Group, and These Friends. His name is Kitman, Marvin, the Finleyville, Brooklyn, New York boy who went to Brooklyn Tech, the humorist, the kibitzer, Marvin Kitman, part two. So we were talking at part one about you and running for the election. You were not the Goldwater guy. I was uh, running for president. You should know I'm a registered Republican, and I ran in the 1964 primaries against Barry Goldwater. And, uh, and um, I, I should point out that I lost. But, but, that, in any, but that had a major effect on your life. It helped you write your first well, I ran. First of all, I ran as a Lincoln Republican, and... Uh, Goldwater, I accused of being a moderate. His ideas went back to McKinley's days, 1900. And as a Lincoln Republican, I went back to 1864. I was a real reactionary now, in the race. Now, how did you get involved with Land Rover on that election? Well, uh, Land Rover, as a vote of confidence in me, had uh, given me a campaign vehicle, and they had actually built a platform on the back of it for me to give speeches. So their claim was I was standing for office, you know, on the British. They were so impressed with you that the Saturday Evening Post had some advertisements with Kitman. I, I wrote, the Saturday Evening Post covered my campaign and supported me uh, editorially. That was one of the reasons they went out of business, I should point out. But at any rate, after losing in that election, um, I, I decided that the Republican Party was not yet ready for Lincoln. So I dropped him, and I discovered another role model. Before we talk about George, your, your role model, that election resulted in your first book, the number one bestseller in your own mind, The True Adventures of Marvin Kidman by Marvin Kidman. It's not in my own mind. That's no, the, no, no, that was the title. That's the official title, yes. the number one bestseller. And if you look it up in the Google or card catalogs, and all, it's still the number one bestseller. And someday, maybe in the 22nd century, they will graduate students writing theses about the great writers 
of the 20, 20th century, uh, they will come upon this. Oh, this must have been important. Now, as a businessman, I hope to uh, to patent that name and that the number one bestseller. Number one bestseller, and everybody in the ads who use that. In, they would well, have to pay have me a small, royalty, a small royalty, a penny I was going to ask now, for. Now, uh, so I have uh, a question. That's what the title After is. After that book, since you said, forget Lincoln, since he didn't help you out, it was George Washington. George Washington. And I was, what impressed me about George Washington is, you know, he ran, um, he was unopposed in 1789 and won. And I figured as a political genius, I could win given those, those conditions, even I could have won. And then I discovered the, what I call the Mount Vernon machine that made Washington possible. Now, now, the author of the George Washington expense account, uh, who is the author of the making of the precedent of 1789, was by General George... Washington, and PFC Marvin Kitman. That's right. Your, re your listeners should know that I'm the only living co-author with George Washington. That's my claim. But to let's fame. talk about the book with the expense account. Well, now, um, you, you know, when he was elected commander-in-chief, he told Congress, I want no salary. I want just my new country to pick up my expenses. And the John Adams and the others thought, my God, what a patriot he was. Well, at any rate, the war went on for eight years, and he kept his receipts for eight years. And then at the end of eight years, he handed in his expense account. And when I was doing the research for the making of the Prefident in 1789, I actually found the original expense account. It was, it was in 1845 that the government published it, and um, long after the statute of limitations ran out. But I discovered reading through all of his journals and all the expenses that he included all of his bar bills and uh, places he slept at and all the equipment that he was buying. He got everything new and uh, and there was... New horses? No, new, right, uh, horses, carriages. The, the, was he a bon viand? Yes, and, and you know, at the... Valley Forge, he had an expense account crowd, the people that were eating with him. And while, and, and I found the bills for what they were ordering, the geese and the turkeys and the pork. And, um, and w one member of the expense account crowd, Colonel um, Knox, weighed, he started out weighing 210, and he wound up at 270 pounds at the end of the war. And you know how the other soldiers, not on the expense account, were living. So, I mean, I traced every item that he listed. So would you say, even though he didn't take a salary, he used a lot of money? So, so if he had taken a salary, they were offering him $500 a month, now that would be six thousand a year. Eight years, forty-eight thousand. And the expense account that he handed in was for four hundred and thirty-two thousand nine hundred and twelve dollars. Now that was back when the dollar really meant something. And um, and you know when he was. I mean, look at the amount of tea we could have bought with that. When he was elected president, he offered the same deal to the country. No salary, just ex my expenses, and Congress turned him down flat. That was the first economy move of the new country. That expense account was the best-selling expense account in history. It even, went into even, four printings. Even the New York Times. They say, Kitman is a very funny writer, and this is a very funny book. The book is also compulsively readable. Oh, I mean, for an expense account, uh, I managed to tell the whole story of the Revolutionary War through all the footnotes explaining what all the items were. Now, the reason it went you know, into... You could have done this it went into like four, Hamilton. 
Yes, well, that's still to come. It went into four printings, and the reason why I found out is that the DAR was buying all the copies and burning them. But at any rate, it's still very pertinent today, you know, given uh, 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 President-elect Trump's uh, uh, not wanting to reveal his, uh, his audit, someday, uh, perhaps me, will be writing the, uh, the um, president, I can't even say the words, President Trump's so, so <laughs> audit. Let's, let's get to this. Okay. How did the sister book, the making of the precedent, the unauthorized campaign biography come about? Well, um, that was actually the original book uh, before the expense account, when I signed so a contract. So you're saying that the New Testament came out after the Old Testament. <laughs> right, in effect. But Simon and Schuster had given me a contract, but at the time I but, was but writing... But what was the difference between this biography and the expense account? Well, that tells, I was starting to say before, before you so rudely interrupted me, that the I discovered the reason... Washington was made to seem unbeatable was because of the Mount Vernon machine, which uh, um, uh, um, Madison and um, Hamilton and, and all the, the, the um, Jefferson, they were all part of to making Washington the president. And uh, particularly Madison was very effective they they made Washington seem unbeatable because he was the hero of the revolution. But in my book, I go over all of the battles that made him uh, that point. And th that was the reason uh, that they named Ma Madison Avenue after James Madison, because he did such a good job. Now, I have a question. What was the year, it was December 7th, I remember the day, that you joined Newsday. What was the year of Newsday? I started as a TV critic December 7th, 1969. Now, when it did was the a, George Washington book, Expensive Count, come out? Th they, that came out in about 1970, 71. So I was already working as the television critic at Newsday. And December 7th, was very significant in TV history because when I started, the network executive said December 7th is a day that will live in infamy because I then started five times a week. 35 years. 35 years later. When did you and Mr. Jim Bowden, the Yankee, decide to do a TV Series. That was, uh, Jim Bowton was, um, he was the author of Ball Four. He was working as, uh, as the uh, sportscaster at the Channel 2 News, and I used to write about him. He was really the best sportscaster. And he decided to do the television series based on the book, and he asked me to... Uh, to co-write it with him and co-create. So, and we so. got on CBS. It was amazing because um, uh, CBS at the time, um, that was the, the years of all in the family. And CBS, you know, we got on the schedule and they slaughtered us right after all in the family on Wednesday nights. And uh, <clears throat> the problem with the show, it, it lasted six episodes. The problem with the show is they insisted that Jim Bouton play the role of Jim Bouton. And he was not very good as Jim Bouton. And he, the, he, he decided to take acting lessons after they committed to the show. So he managed to be converted from uh, he had been a, a, a wooden figure to start with, and then he wound up as a plastic figure after his acting lesson. Now, your role in this series was what? I was the co-writer with uh, Jim Bouton and co-creator, and it, 
that uh, it was very unusual for Newsday. I was still writing my columns, and there were some people who thought that this was a conflict of interest. And Newsday, I explained to them, this gave me the opportunity to find out why TV works like that. It was like being inside the clock. And um, so they allowed me to do it for one season. And, uh, but you didn't have to worry, it was only six shows. Well, it could have been a hit. And Newsday said I could only do one show. And I, w after that, I had to decide. I could have retired and left Newsday and, uh, and gone out to L.A. and become a TV writer. In television, they, they respect failure. What they don't want is somebody who had a newcomer, so that if Mark Twain showed up in uh, in Hollywood to do a, a sitcom, they would never hire him because he had never written anything for television. And even though it's a fa I, w I had a solid record of failure there. At any rate, I decided that I'm going to stay at Newsday. I was not going to live the life of the swimming pools and all of that. Luxury. And But during that period of time when you were writing these articles five days a week, syndicated for the Los Angeles Times, you decided that the Kitman tape should come out, a book by the T TV's number one critic about sex, violence, dynasty, Dallas, TNA, New York, L.A., drugs, Runeology, and the hero cars. Well, all right, maybe number six. I am a VCR. What was this about? Well, that told of my exciting experiences as a TV critic. Being a TV critic was a very dangerous profession. I mean, next to uh, being a test pilot or the president of the United States, because television had affected your mind. I could have, during that period when sex and violence was so big, I could have become a sex maniac having to sit there you know, write five columns a week for 35 years, yeah, the they impact. Have, they, they didn't have the cable at that time. I mean, you know, they were just basic shows. Yeah, but nevertheless, the, that was the big debate, sex and violence. And it, those two issues in my many years Yeah, but there, from the George it was like a, book, you know, yeah, I mean, there was sex and violence in the expense account, well, probably. Yes, and that's one of the reasons it was such a bestseller. But you have to realize that basically I'm not a renaissance man. I'm more of a middle-aged man. You're, you're a Seth Lowe guy, you know. And, you're and, Brooklyn Tech. And I could do, I could be one of the nation's leading television critics and a historian at the same time. Let's continue on. You know, it's like the, the babies over there. Bill O'Reilly, Okay. The Man Who Would Not Shut Up, The Rise of Bill O'Reilly by Marvin Kitman. You know, I had done iconic figure in George Washington, and Bill O'Reilly was the next iconic figure. At the time, he was really quite popular, even when the book was written a few years ago. And, um, and how I used to see, I should point out, that that is one of the few books that ever said anything good about Bill O'Reilly, except for the six books he wrote about himself. What, at the time, he was uh, growing up in Levittown on Long Island, and I was the local TV critic at Newsday, so he used to read all of my columns, and I think that I influenced his kind of journalism. I was always against the Walter Cronkite type of, of uh, you know, not having opinions about anything, just saying, and, and that's the way it is. And, um, and O'Reilly seemed to have something, he was very opinionated, and of course he was, um, uh, he 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 was um, had opinions about everything, and he was often wrong. But he believed in his opinions. At any rate, so he gave me 
29 interviews that I had. So he was up for this. Yeah, yeah, no, any question, anything you want more of, just uh, ask. And then after and, the, and what happened, came out? And what happened, the book, even though the New York Times said that as O'Reilly's uh, Boswell, I had managed incredibly to do a fair and balanced book about him. Wait a second. Fair and balanced. Isn't that the reporting of Fox? Isn't that what they say? They're fair and balanced? That's right. Let's talk about the Fox effect on broadcasting. It was a major effect. You know, they had a way... What they did was decide on three stories and they would repeat the same three stories all day. And, um, and that, you know, stories that nobody else thought of as news. By the repetition, they made it seem like important. Like sex and violence. Yeah. And, but what happened is that their ratings started to go up and the other cable network shows news was starting to copy them. So CNN, for example, had been really the best originally, and they really just covered news all the time as it happened. But they started to see from Fox that you did not have to cover everything. If you just keep repeating, then people would start believing this was important. But, but when you wrote this Fox article, you, you talked about their reporters. What was your thoughts about some of the reporters? I think it said some of them were rather bland or they were, they, they were staged. I mean, some of the shows were the guy once picking up his cell phone to call his bookmaker or something like that. Yeah. Well, I have to be honest with you that um, being a TV critic has affected my mind. And I wrote and said a lot of things in the past. And, um, and I have managed to forget about a lot of things. Now, I don't, it's the only way that I've been able to survive as a TV critic. Would you tell me about this picture of you in Cuba and how you arrived there? I, um, as, uh, as the Renaissance man, I, an historian, I went to Cuba, and in order to get into Cuba, you have to have, at that time, this was in the early 2000s, you had to have a cultural, a scholarly um, uh, interest. So I went with my wife and a few friends as Hemingway scholars. And uh, at the time, uh, although they didn't ask specifically what I was studying there in terms of Hemingway, but I was studying the mojito and, uh, and Hemingway's either influenced the mojito or he was the mojito influenced him. So that was our trip to Cuba. And, uh, and I discovered there that I hated mojitos, but fortunately my wife, who doesn't usually drink, loved mojitos. But at any rate, this picture was taken at the, uh, the museum, the National Museum there, and I saw that portrait there, and for somehow I found my arm going up as if I was El Presidente, you know, this fantasy I had lost in 1964, but if I had been in Cuba and had used the uh, 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 Fidel's uh, tactics that I could have done better. That's what that picture now, now And it was just a coincidence. But, but you did, you know, total coincidence. Let's talk about, you, you've won a couple of awards. I mean, weren't you uh, up for a Pulitzer once? That's right. I was um, uh, in the short list, the Pulitzer uh, in criticism, and, uh, you know, I was in the top three. That's for my commentaries about... I, w I would... I would see television as something to uh, comment about all the things going on in the world. What about Townsend? You won the Townsend Award from City College? Townsend Harris, yes. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, they, they recognize uh, talent, yeah. 
and, and, and uh, I, not, I, I, and, and you're even, you know, I know all modesty. I don't talk about my many rewards. I'm bringing that up. You know? that, yeah, you know. What, what about the in the in the Hall of Fame from Brooklyn Tech because you were such well, a great Brooklyn Tech. Now that that is an award that I'll talk about because I got in Brooklyn Tech is an engineering school and I passed the test to get in and it turned out that I had two weaknesses math and science so fortunately I was studying civil engineering at Brooklyn Tech fortunately I decided not to become an engineer. But they gave you this award. Well because I had despite Brooklyn Tech English Department had decided that I was a terrible writer and I, <laughs> I did not know I could write until I got to college. But I was an overachiever. And as a matter of fact, they invited me to speak to the, to the graduating class. And I spoke to the bottom half of the class, of which I was a representative. Look how far I have gone being such a... Uh, Terrible student. Let's talk about overachievement. A couple of things left with a short period of time. Your wife, of how many years? Wait a minute. You mean we're going to run out of time again? No, we're going to finish it quick. <laughs> how many years ago did you meet your wonderful wife? I met my wife in 1951. It was a great time for wives. So we are now in our uh, 65th year of happy uh, matrimony. And um, they don't even, that is so old, they don't even have uh, a silver, diamond, platinum. I guess it's a and platinum. Let's talk about the, 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 the kinder. Tell me about the children. I have three wonderful children. I have a, a son, Jamie, who is a, uh, a lawyer and a rock band a manager and a great writer. He writes about automobiles and op-eds for the New York Times. My daughter Susie is a painter in uh, Portland, Oregon, and she's a realist painter at a time when minimal is, is good. And my daughter Andrea is a fashion stylist in London. And how many grandchildren do you have? <laughs> I have three grandchildren. I have Ike Clemente, my grandson, who is named after Roberto Clemente, because right. I'm from Pittsburgh originally, and we're big pirate fans. Uh, my uh, granddaughter, Ellie Beatrice, and, uh, and that's her real name, Ellie, and, and her third? nickname is Eleanor. The third is, uh, is Milo Finn. And his middle name is uh, after Huck Finn, and he's the youngest. And he's a, they're all great pirate fans and Steeler fans. And all, all I can tell you things. is, you know, with doing close to 300 shows, I've enjoyed many of them, but I haven't enjoyed as much <laughs> having you here today. Well, I thank must, you for being here. I, if you don't interrupt me so much, I'd be able to get across my points. But thank you. And by the way, everything I've said is off the record. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Kidman.